Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, every time uh, I get to talk about money, I'm happy and excited because money is something that raises you, uh, your breath pressure in much more efficient way than, than coffee. So without any further ado and n unfunny jokes from the moderator, I'm going to introduce uh, the speakers. So we have uh, Anna Charrière, who works uh, at Sense and is in the middle. Uh, we have uh, Professor William Uricchio, who's on my left. And we have Alexander Netic from Arte, uh, and he's on my far left. So um, in general, when we are talking about financing, there, um, there are a few questions. How to find money, how to create a budget, and how to uh, assess how much money the content will earn and uh, I would like to open our discussion with uh, in a way comparison the traditional financing model in culture to the digital or interactive one because when you're making a film and uh, since I'm a film journalist this is the closest uh, uh, genre for me well you get a lot of choices you can uh, apply for a subsidy from the National Film Institute that can fi finance up to 50% of the budget of the film. Then there's uh, other public sources. Then if you go in international co-production, you can apply for uh, money from different countries. And then you have to have your own money up to like, I don't know, 5%. So uh, if you have that uh, public money, you can start making a film and then the film goes into the cinemas and the tickets provide money that go back to the producer and uh, the, you can earn uh, a lot because the tickets have a very high cost and then there's television rights and so on and so forth. But in interactive uh, digital um, content, projects, I think it works differently. And I would like to ask you to discuss and introduce uh, the general idea how, to, um, how the system works within the interactive projects. Anna? Thank you. Um, is it working? Do you hear me? Uh, so, I will just speak a little bit about uh, the CNC, so it's the French Institute, uh, the Cinema uh, French Institute. Um, and so we are under the Ministry of Culture and we usually, so uh, the traditional way is, as you say, to uh, save money from taxes, so from tickets, from audiovisual projects, uh, from television, and everything is uh, for distribution to go back into a kind of a big account. And this account is going back through selective and automatic uh, process to the producers and authors and so on. So for for the digital part for the CNC part. Uh, it's been around 10 years now that we have been developing specific uh, aid to support digital changes and to try to be um, very close to the creative, digital creators. So it was the same way for us to help those creators, uh, to help them to um, through not automatic but through uh, selective committees to get funds to finance almost 50% of the budget as you say so for us it's almost the same way that traditional way to finance projects at the beginning so they are the producer are coming and they uh, financing the project that they pre-financing the project before releasing it. It's a very audiovisual and cinema cinematographic way, like very traditional way to do it, even if it's digital. And so we will talk about the distribution later, but for the, the way to earn money before and to make the project available, it's actually pretty the same way. 
Um, just, um, I would like to follow up on the, what you just said. Um, can you compare the traditional uh, budgets um, for, I don't know, feature films or documentary films? Because in Poland, I would say documentary film budget starts with, I don't know, 10,000 euro, and uh, feature film may start even with uh, 200,000 uh, euros. And I was wondering, uh, can you compare maybe in the percentage uh, the, the difference in mm. in the size of uh, traditional and uh, yeah, it, it will be. I'm sorry, but I, I think it will be very difficult because when we are talking about interactive projects, we've got so many different kind of projects. We've got application, we've got VR project, we've got digital series. It could be animation, it could be fiction, it could be documentary. So it's so large, and you cannot have any uh, like statistics, like very clever statistics that can be available. We always have, most of the time, a very specific project with a specific topic and the form that the creators have to find, like specific form to be uh, relevant for the subject. So you don't have like a limit that you can fund up to 50% of the budget or, I don't know, 200,000 euro? We've got a limit. It's uh, the budget we've got uh, each year. It's 3 million. <laughs> it's a kind of limit, and we're trying to help the most of uh, a lot of projects that most of projects that we can. But I will let Alexander. Yes, I just wanted to talk about numbers as well. That's why I uh, asked yeah, you for yeah. details, Alexander. Uh, <coughs> yeah, just uh, to broaden a little bit this perspective. Um, uh, so, so I'm Alexander, working for Arte, which is just. Franco-German broadcast that also exists now a little bit in Spanish and Polish and in, in, in English. And so we, uh, um, we work with producers on both sides of the Rhine and we are super happy to have the CNC actually on the French side. Because, uh, because actually uh, uh, France is one of the countries uh, in Europe and in the world this is, that, that has done the most for those uh, new creative industries. Uh, treating them like other creative industries and uh, this is r really super important uh, we don't have that on the german side at all uh, on the german side we have uh, like traditional funds obviously only regional funds because because nothing except the national parliament is national in germany uh, uh, so uh, so so everything is really like federal you have like like a the, the Bavarian Film Fund, uh, the, the the Film Fund from from Bremen, which is like uh, um, a, a, like a region smaller than Warsaw, that has its own fund, um, and especially many of those funds are pretty traditional. I once asked, for example, the fund in not rhine westfalen which is the region of Cologne. Yeah, what are your criteria? Uh, when did you fix your criteria? They told me, yeah, it was in 1963. <coughs> so obviously, it's pretty difficult there to get uh, to get financing for new media because for them it was like still Ellen Turing kind of stuff when they fixed those criteria. <laughs> so uh, so it's uh, it's it's really great to have uh, this uh, this financing on the on the French side because uh, in general in Europe uh, we still uh, lack those uh, those means. Uh, on the on the other hand, on the French side, we can uh, co-produce a lot of uh, things together because we talk to each other. This is also something that does not exist in Germany because, like the funds and the broadcasters, don't talk to each other; they hate each other. So you uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's like uh, the, the the criteria of the funds are exactly the opposite criteria of the broadcasters. When you work with a public broadcaster in Germany you have not the right to monetize your project because it's like publicly funded so you shouldn't become rich with it which makes sense but like the main obligation of the fund in berlin is that you have to show that you can monetize your project which will be pretty difficult when you want to collaborate with a broadcaster uh, so yeah we are basically very lucky to have you so so maybe just to step back even one more step and amplify um, and echo what Alexander and Anna said. Um, we're, it's still very early days. I mean, we're, this is like 10, a decade plus a couple of years of interactive. And it doesn't act, and it's very culturally specific what kind of an entity it is. So the French are always ahead when it comes to patrimony and funding culture. Uh, the Americans are always in last place 
when it comes to thinking beyond commercial. To me, the two most developed cultures for interactive are, are France and the French part of Canada. Um, and the National Film Board, so for example, has done this in a very clever way. It's an organization, that probably the world's largest uh, documentary producer. Uh, the way they've done it is to try to tie interactive into feature development. So if you make a linear, a, a traditional linear project, there's a requirement that it have some kind of appendage, some kind of a, an add-on that's digital. And that's a way for them to sort of start the process of helping people think about digital technologies, think about digital uh, environments for their, for their product, a way to reach bigger audiences. And in fact, they've discovered their interactives reach a much bigger audience globally than their linear products. So that's encouraged them to put more and more, a bigger and bigger percentage of their budget into interactive. Uh, but it's a very, I think it's a very local story. Each country kind of has its own specificity. And the things to watch, um, first of all, we know that the, uh, no critique intended for linear makers, but the situation is dominated by linear filmmakers and linear television makers. It's their world. And they see this upstart, this newcomer, trying to take some money. So, so naturally, there's some resistance. So the thing to really watch are for language like creative industries, because that opens it up to kind of a broader, less medium-specific space. A place to look for money are places like uh, economic development ministry, or uh, uh, sometimes the finance, yeah, well, finance ministry, sometimes technology ministry, or whoever's in charge of technology. Because often interactives are understood not just as a product, as a, as, a, as a media product, but actually as a way to give a broader public media literacy or a way to help develop I, it's the case in Poland. Clearly, the, the government sees this as a way to build capacity in the digital space. So that means you could go to the traditional media funds, but you might also think of these other sectors where there's a big incentive to fund interactive, because they're looking at it differently. They're looking at it as capacity building in the digital space. So because you know the, the fact that interactive is not exactly well defined, all the things you said, VR, AR, interactive, uh, could, be, could be anything. And because there's resistance in the film and, and broadcast world, um, it really means, so, so that could be a bad thing, but it could be a good thing. And when it's a good thing, it means you have a lot of extra places to look, a lot of other ways to frame the argument. And since uh, we are talking about interactive projects, feel free to ask questions uh, at any time and interact with our speakers. Just raise your hand and uh, wait for the microphone because we need uh, for our translation purposes. Um, Okay, so uh, we already covered the general um, idea, and uh, I was wondering, since it's uh, such a broad sen uh, such a broad definition of interactive project and digital project, how do you uh, assess which product sh pr project should get a support and which should uh, reevaluate its um, I don't know ideas or. Um, Uh, for us in in France at the CNC, for the new media fund, it's a very, as uh, William said, like it's a very uh, author point of view uh, way. Like we, the, the 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 we we can help from the concept to the production through uh, development. So at the beginning, for the concept, it's only for authors. So it could be very wide, very large, and uh, they just need to bring the committee to their universe, to the to have a, a, a kind of very specific uh, and personal point of view. Um, for the development, it will be absolutely the same, but uh, with a producer like that can. Um, uh, that can like show to the committee that the, the 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 producer is able to support and to help the the, the creator to to go 
on through his IDs, her ID, and, and to make the, the, the project available because it could be very specific uh, with uh, some, for instance, for VR projects, that the, if the production is not um, aware of all the difficulty that the sitting, the, 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 the shooting could be, the post-production and all those stuff that they need to, how do you say, like they need to uh, convince the committee that they are able to be, uh, how do you say? They can surround themselves. Yeah, they can surround themselves by, by people, they can help them on that. But for the produ production part, uh, we the committee could be more aware and we usually come uh, as a last financial uh, partner. We are waiting for the production uh, company to be um, to be supported by other like private funds or, or or broadcasters. Like we are really most of the project actually in interactive storytelling or, or VR projects are supported by broadcasters like. Arte or France Television, uh, French, uh, the, the French TV uh, called France Television, and CNC, because it's still for the moment, as William said, there is we are still trying to help the productions companies to help them to find a market. It's still the early age, and even if we had before like web documentaries and all these kind of uh, uh, forms that arrived, it was, uh, for me, I think it was a kind of way to reach an audience to, to, to try to, to know how to build a story on, on the web and to, to, to know how to do and what, not what to do and, and some f forms appears with uh, uh, much more, um, Specific, uh, specificities with, uh, uh, for instance, the application like interactive storytelling that you can find on your app. It's not video games, but it's not an audiovisual uh, project. It's something in between. Uh, it's the same for VR. VR was uh, uh, arrived uh, with this volunteer from uh, the creators to immerse people to uh, interact with uh, an audience to so it it was like but sorry i'm I'm talking about all the stuff <laughs> no no uh, <laughs> I interact with the subject uh, freely so um basically that's the first difference from the uh that I notice uh because traditionally when you're trying to find money for a film. Um, in Poland, Polish Film Institute is the pla first place uh, you go and then you look for uh, other uh, sources, television, regi regional film funds and uh, private money. So how does it work uh, in, uh, in your company, in Arte? Actually, our criteria is slightly different. I mean, we are Arte, we are not the big broadcaster putting game shows and sports in the prime time. So obviously we also uh, uh, we also support authors, but in general, we are a little bit the dark side. Uh, obviously, we are like uh, you said, dark side uh, or yeah, dark 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 side, like like the Galactic Empire, like, like yes, yes, Darth Vader. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> uh, because what we uh, what we want obviously to to do is to, uh, to reach audiences. Uh, it's it's our main objective. We are we are a media, so we are there to connect authors with with audiences. So our main criteria have evolved a lot during the last 10 years because uh, it's only the beginnings, but uh, still 10 years on the web is, uh, is a lot of time. So uh, when at the beginning, uh, it was obviously before my time, but when the first project arrived uh, in France, uh, thanks to uh, private support, thanks to public support, uh, they uh, actually independent producers put a lot of pressure on broadcasters because broadcasters uh, inside their institutions there was just nobody able to evaluate uh, those kind of projects. I, I remember super well it was like my th third week at, at Arte and it was already 2011 uh, and somebody called me to change uh, his toner of his printer basically because he thought I was working on the internet so so I could also change the 
toner of, 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 of the printer. Uh, three weeks later, again, somebody called me telling me, yeah, you are doing stuff for the website of Arte. Could you just send me a PDF every day <laughs> telling me what you are doing? And I suggested him just to go on the website to see what, what I was doing or that I could uh, just send him a fax. But uh, uh, but it's um, uh, it really has uh, has evolved a lot since then. We we, we built teams in order to to assess those projects. Uh, but uh, um, during the last, especially four or five years, uh, the internet has changed. Even it, the, the whole structure of the internet changed, where we used to produce uh, pieces like uh, Gazas de Rot, Prison Valley, uh, which were like interactive browser-based documentaries for desktop computers. If there are two things that are slowly disappearing, is browser-based content and desktop computers. So uh, we really had to reevaluate, uh, wanting to reach audiences, how we select projects. <clears throat> so today it would be obvious, obviously more mobile first, but especially really platform-based projects. So projects directly thought for Instagram, projects directly thought for VR goggles and uh, specific VR goggles because the marketplace of HTC Vive on Steam VR is not the same than uh, the, 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 the marketplace of, uh, of Oculus on the Oculus Store. So, so we, we really want to be platform based and in general we are not very fond on like transmedia to say a bad word. <laughs> so, so like basically uh, those dossiers that arrive and it starts with I have an author's documentary about a village in Siberia and I want to make this like I want to turn this into the new Star Wars. Uh, so I have two video games about it, I have four, four board games, I have one installation, uh, I, have <clears throat> I have a real marketing strategy and you, and you get a dossier of 50 pages and you say, well, you really know how to distribute your content, but actually what, what, what's your content again? So, uh, so, 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 so it's really, uh, for, for us, what's, uh, what's important that it really uh, uh, serves well one platform and not too many of them, because uh, many of, especially documentary projects, are not like huge blockbuster projects. They don't have, the, they even don't have the money to finance the feature films. So how could they finance such a great transmedia world? And this is also where I would nuance what, what, what you said, William, before uh, about um, about Canada. I think when they began to build this industry, and Canada went even further than France in this, because I would say it's the only country where this is an industry actually more even than in than in France. They uh, uh, they like to they they call it like the conversion projects like having always uh, you, you in order to get financing for linear, you needed to do something online, which was really interesting to build competences within the production companies within uh, the the broadcasting companies, but it also created the little kind of monsters. I remember super well this 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 Canadian producer um, <clears throat> who was doing a super nice documentary series about. Uh, how do you say the continental drift? Uh, like it was in 2012, it was for 100 years of the of veganist theory about the continental drift, and it was like like typical discovery series, prime time, beautiful mountains, beautiful volcanoes, just great. And then she tells me, yeah, and we want to do something online. Okay, what's what's your plan? Yeah, a discussion forum. What? Yeah, we we want to debate the continental drift. Like like against or in favor? Yes. I don't know, but m m me personally, I, I don't really have an opinion. I try to live with it. <laughs> You're just trying to survive. But it sounds like um, the the digital uh, culture is uh, drifting itself. Um, it's changing uh, very quickly, very dynamically. And therefore, the criteria of evaluating the projects uh, change uh, quickly as well. Is that? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe just to add, uh, the, the, the world, uh, so I go occasionally to sunny side of the dock, and I, the marketplace there is, for me, eye-opening. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a funder, and I'm not a maker. I'm a critic and an observer. But what I watch there is people coming in with 50% of their funding already. They're looking to the world's great broadcasting companies for, the, for matching. And um, I have never... I guess I understand now why there's so much sameness in the world of broadcast documentary. Because people require three acts. When they talk about genre, I mean, you're sitting with a group of people making historical documentaries. To me, that's a genre. No, the genre is, is this a voiceover? 
is this, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking of it in structural terms, and it's incredibly conformist because it's got to work across multiple cultures where people's expectations are clear. So one thing that, that Interactive already has going against it is that it's, it's not clear. Like, it's very different forms. It's still morphing very quickly. It can, you can say, I want, a, I want an Interactive like uh, one millionth tower or out my window. You can do that. But as a field, it's, it's very dynamic. And as a funding field, linear is very, very conformist and fixed. So that's one problem. Second big problem is with linear, you can kind of guess. You can make a pretty good estimate of how big the audience reach will be, maybe even how much money it should make. Mm -hmm. With interactive, the business models are very also erratic and unstable. <laughs> And, and I, I guess when I talk to organizations about trying to convince them they should be investing more in interactive, to me, the profit is not money. The profit is capacity building. It's building knowledge about how you could use this. It's building an understanding of which new audiences you might be able to reach with this that your linear product is not already reaching. Uh, so it requires thinking a little bit differently both about what that entity is and what that entity will produce. It, it, it's, a, it's a leap. It's a leap of faith still. And the longer we're in it, the easier it gets, but it's still early days. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, what you're saying. And, and just to also say that it's moving a lot. And also for the, the economic part, there is no model. And we are trying also to push the producers in France to try to find other partners to go more into co-production because the, the, the web is, there is no boundaries. So you have to also to, to try to, to be open-minded and to, 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 to try to do a lot of co-production because it could be another way to find fundings and to, to to be to find another form to reach a larger audience if it's possible and also it's a way to be outside of the traditional way to finance project we are trying to put less pressure on the broadcaster <laughs> and to to tell to tell the producer it's it's important that to be dependent on one only one for because now Arte, they, they are doing a lot, but that's normal that they cannot uh, be here for every form. For instance, they are going into video games. It's another interactive uh, kind of project. We are talking a lot about this, the audiovisual uh, interactive storytelling. But there is also video game that they could move, but they are built into, the model is built on another way, like it's very profit, uh, a commercial way of thinking. And we are trying to kind of, um, uh, how do you say, like uh, to put some ideas to create also non-profit kind of project into the interactive field. There is, it's a very, uh, I don't want to be pat patriotic, but <laughs> In France, the CNC was built on this idea to, to, to have this kind of soft power on culture, on movies. So, <laughs> and, and it's the same for, for, I think it's kind of sa same way for interactive projects to, to help people to just be create, creators in a way. So, so um, well, if I could just give an example yes. of this, because it's a really concrete example. Um, and, and it's a great point that these document these these forms require thinking outside the box, and they're built to think outside the box. So a great example is uh, Kat, Katerina Sizek, who has this high rise series that she did with National Film Board, and National Film Board and found partners, and they paid for it. But she did one for the New York Times called "Short History of the High Rise." She partnered with the Times. Her content came from the New York Times. The photo what they call the morgue, the place where you put dead people and you put, yeah, an archive in proper words, Times calls it the morgue. Her main stuff was the photos from the morgue, the, the, the New York Times photos. She made an interactive documentary uh, 
But the best part was that documentary was distributed and paid for by the Times. So on the digital, on the page of the digital New York Times, there's a little link. It looks like a story, like something you'd click and it would be a, a print story. But in this case, it was an interactive documentary. So think about it. She's getting her materials from the Times and a lot of, a lot of something worth money. She has a distribution platform that's reaching millions of people interested in the world, interested in facts, and she's got a, she's got a fiscal subsidy behind her. So that's exactly this example of this kind of finding other partners, thinking outside the box, and in this case, finding a brilliant uh, distribution model. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have a question. As um, I may, I'm not into creation, like for now, um, and I'm wondering because um, w can you tell can you tell us um, s like specific f um, places or sources of this additional funds that interactive digital projects can get? Uh, because um, what I was thinking about is like crowdfunding. People need something. They enjoy something. They like the idea, so they pay their own money and they they use it. Uh, I'm one. So one question is about the sources, and the other one is what do you think? Because in some, p uh, it's not an accusation, but it is like for for me, it's a fact that uh, some cultural events or projects are really uh, directed uh, to the small audience, or not only. Um, because they are niche, but because, as he, William said, they haven't got this platform to spread. Uh, so, they are, so there are some money from the funds going to those projects, but limited people see can enjoy them. So my second question is, what are your thoughts about this in the future, you know, what's there with this? Just follow up maybe on the on the first question about uh, additional financing. Uh, it's 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 pretty tough. Uh, what, what William just said about the New York Times and and Cat's work. Uh, if you do that in France uh, and you just uh, suggest Le Monde, uh, yeah, yeah they, they they tried, but they tried it basically with CNC money and giving some thousand <laughs> euros, uh, uh, <coughs> making everybody believe they are broadcasters now. So 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 it's 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 really it's really complicated because uh, like French press is. They, they, they get more money from the state than we do as public service basically it's it's really <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, they, they get a lot of subsidies because they don't have a very strong business model anymore um, <clears throat> I would be in general pretty skeptical about crowdfunding uh, because um, it works really well for some kind of uh, of formats like video games uh, fan movies I, I, there, there were like those typical examples like a cosmonaut or I iron sky did somebody from you see I iron sky I, I i love to pitch it it's it's basically five years ago there was a, a movie that didn't get any financing so they went on kickstarter they put like a trailer, uh, like like some kind of nearly creepy pasta trailer uh, and they earned like Two million dollars. Is it the one with Nazis on the moon? On the moon, exactly. So the pitch is basically the Nazis never, uh, uh, they never died. They just fled to the moon and they're living on the dark side of the moon. And one day they come, led by Udo Kier, obviously, to destroy us. <clears throat> so this is the pitch. They eventually funded the film, but, but uh, this is pretty far away from Arthur's documentary. So, uh, so, so, so I would see it a little bit more, uh, uh, more skeptical, and also in general, there, there is this whole theory about Kickstarter being actually more kick finisher than Kickstarter, like, 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 like really, get, really getting the last uh, funds you still need, but you already have to have a pretty uh, big um, audience, uh, a pretty big community. So I would be a little bit more skeptical about that. Uh, and uh, especially I think a public broadcaster is in a very weird position uh, if uh, you have a project where there's also crowdfunding money because we are a little bit like the biggest crowdfunding project of post-war Europe so, uh, so so always in a weird position we did it for two or three projects and it was always yeah but already paid my taxes why should I give more money to this uh, art project so I'm just going to speak because I come from the land of no public financing or very little, <laughs> and Trump has taken that away. Um, 
I think a, a little bit also depends on the nature of the project. And there are certainly, just as we can talk about crowdfunding, we can talk about crowdsourcing in the sense of the project. So if you, uh, Chris Milk's uh, Johnny Cash uh, uh, project, uh, or the, uh, the Man with the Movie Camera remix project, uh, 18 Days in Egypt. These would be examples of, of projects where the crowd is also sending in the material. And I think really one of the great um, innovators in this space institutionally has been the Guardian newspaper in Britain. So a project like The Counted, I, I would call it a documentary, some people might not, but it really exists thanks to the labor of a lot of people across the US. This is about a project about uh, people killed by police in America. And it's uh, the, the, the FBI, the most powerful police agency in the US says they have no idea. How, how could they know how many people are killed by the police? So this is a project that started where people across, in, all over the US send in news reports when someone is killed by the police. And uh, a clip from a newspaper, a TV broadcast, whatever. The Guardian's reporters check it all out. And they built a very robust uh, website that you can organize in countless different ways, by area, by weapon, by age, by race, whatever, um, to really explore this. And it's, it turns out it's four or five people a day, every day, die by the police. Turns out like 25% of them die from tasers, which are supposed to be harmless. That the people that die by tasers are in their 20s and 30s. They're not just 100 years old. So anyway, very useful kind of project. But the only way, I mean, it would cost the Guardian way too much to do it itself, so they've actually distributed the labor. And there's a lot of projects like, there's, there's, there's a growing number of projects. WBEZ in Chicago uh, has a project called Curious City that crowdsources the ideas to make uh, stories. Like, what do people want to hear about? And then they crowdsource the labor of making them. So money, of course, is always needed no matter what. But you can also lower that a lot by getting more, if you have a project that involves more people. Yeah, I think we've got like two different, like two continental, like two worlds. Because <laughs> we tried, as uh, they, they did with uh, the New York Times and The Guardian in France, to try to do the same. But as Alexander said, uh, for newspaper, it's they were into a crisis that they are still in, actually. And they, it was uh, an illusion uh, to think that they could give money for this kind of project, that actually they, for some project they need a lot. And, and I think it was uh, a really bad idea because it also cut a kind of uh, partners, partnership that they are, the newspaper uh, that really important for uh, distribution and to show project and it's also uh, a part of your question and this kind of project um, we've got it's it's real uh, we've got a lack uh, a lack of uh, of of uh, highlight of uh, uh, of distribution because most of the producers they are small uh, production companies they are small studios and they are not distribution distributors they are not used to uh, build uh, an audience before and in France we don't have uh, this habit to uh, ask money to the audience it's a way crowdfunding could be a way to reach an audience to build a very large audience but it's absolutely not uh, a French way of thinking. It's not, uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, maybe it could work in some, uh, maybe in Britain, but I'm not sure, in uh, UK. But I, I think I totally agree with you. It's not a real uh, way of thinking, the exception culturelle and, and like, like uh, cultural subsidies, but what I found more tragic, and I'm basically attacking myself, is that broadcasters haven't learned to distribute content online oh. for the moment and and this is uh, this is the, the main problem you, you remember the guy who wanted me to change his toner in it? uh, it's uh, uh, he was like the head of marketing at that time uh, it, it's it's only six years ago so 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 so, so it's, uh, it, it's it's really for for the moment we really uh, didn't learn from a, a public broadcaster perspective I mean we don't have to transform into vice or into BuzzFeed 
because we obviously have another mission, but we didn't learn at all to distribute for the moment. And the problem is we, we learn it now and we see that, uh, and it joins also your second question, um, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to uh, learn how to distribute and not to format things, because if TV is so formatted, it's also because it's a major medium where you know more or less what works and what doesn't work, and you uh, n know that you should not surprise too much your audience, like not at all in the best case. Uh, uh, even if you're a public service, uh, which on the web we try to avoid for the moment, but we see that also on the web people are lazy, they don't want to interact, they just want to scroll their timelines. Uh, so, so, so it's pretty difficult because learning how to distribute, we also lose a little bit of this, uh, of, of the spirit of not formatting things. Yeah, and, and, but we have to know what we distribute, like what kind of project you will not do the same for, uh, an, for an application or a, a video game as a, for a uh, series, a TV. And, and we can learn a lot from also the market, the video game market, how they distribute the project. But I think we've got also a problem in France that marketing was a kind of bad word. That we cannot have market into the same sentence as culture. And I, of course, I'm I'm uh, doing a v uh, it's it's. An exaggeration, but it's also another way to think. And and for uh, interactive project, for web project, you have to reach uh, specific audience. And sometimes it means to also find the partners that it will help you to find the, this specific audience for. Instance we've got with uh, AR, AR a lot of project that they can appear, and um, with uh, for instance editors like uh, book editors, and they can also th there is money from uh, book market for instance, and they there is some uh, edi editors we call uh, in France uh, les éditions volumiques, uh, so I don't know how to translate it. It's like volume editors and they are doing uh, books and application and you can have some AR uh, project for children and it's also another kind of uh, interactive storytelling uh, with an object with connected objects and and they can have money for that so it's always the way is always to think about which uh, partner will be relevant for which kind of subject and which kind of form that I can find. And so it needs to, to have speech like very early, in the early age of the, of the project and to think about, to be open mind and to reach a lot of different uh, perspectives and different uh, skills, I think, for this kind of project. I want to make three quick, three really quick points. One, if you think about cinema, it took, it, at least in the US, it took film a good 10 or 11 years to figure out a business model. At first, they charged a lot of money, like a dollar back in 1898, 1900, that was a lot of money. 1906, they decided to go from a dollar to five cents, and the business is revolutionized. Suddenly, audiences go from a couple of million a year to maybe 16 million a week. So that's a big, that's a dramatic shift, um, which is counterintuitive. Why would you charge five cents if you could charge 100 cents? So that's, we, we need to kind of look at those, some of these earlier models and see th that sometimes things that are counterintuitive actually can be quite productive. Um, second thing is I think it's very helpful to learn from failure. And, um, and, and I don't mean, to connect failure to the name I'm going to announce here. I mean, I, I love David Dufresne and his work, but David has really been pushing uh, the idea of working partnerships with the Süddeutsche Zeitung and with uh, some uh, a French paper, Le Monde maybe, Le Monde, um, with the, the Toronto Call, or sorry, I should know the names of this, 
Toronto Star. He's, he, so we did a project, Fort McMoney, that was in partnership, like there was reporting done in real time in the newspaper. Uh, his game on football was also done yeah. with a French paper, trying to reach a sport audience with interactives. So I, I guess they didn't, the, the newspaper partnership didn't work so well, but very useful to, to understand and learn from that. And the third thing, the children. We, you know, media folks tend to think about an audience that's an adult audience. And really, with a lot of this stuff, the audience that really matters most is the audience of the future. It's kids. And I want to give one example of what I think is a fabulous um, kind of business idea. In the Netherlands, the biggest chain of grocery stores, the sort of Carrefour of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Netherlands is a company called Albert Heijn. They, they're a big global player. They own a lot of companies under different names. Albert Heijn had a campaign. If you bought 10 euros worth of groceries, you'd get a little card. And the little card opened into four cards. And the four cards went into a book you could buy for 50 cents, a collector book for pictures of dinosaurs. This was a, a campaign pitched at kids between maybe seven, I don't know, dinosaur age, five till, five till 12. You could collect these cards. And the cards, oh, you could also buy a, a, a headset, a plastic headset for a few euros. This was an AR and VR project. The cards, if you held your phone over the card, the dinosaur would jump up and run over your hand, and you could try to catch it. If you put on the headset, you'd see v you were in Dino World VR. What a smart, A, the grocery store paid a fortune to this company for a, a brilliant project, a really smart, inspired project. Sam Howe was the company. Um, and it was a really good way to reach an audience that is the audience that, in a certain way. They don't have the money yet, but they will. <laughs> Um, there was a question here, but I just want to make sure that your uh, questions were uh, fully answered. Yes, Perfect. I'm really inspired by the class sourcing, thinking as a founder. Okay, so now me. Um, hi, I'm, I'm from Adam Miskevich Institute, uh, from the communication department. And uh, what my question is, it's also about financing, but not a whole project, but like a specific part of the project. Because like now I will say a small anecdote. If you let me so like two years ago we we like came up with this amazing idea to make a multimedia guide to polish culture to each field of polish culture for foreigners and we're like totally fixed and obsessed about it and we put like lots of effort lots of sleepless nights and stuff and like i still think it's a really nice project so like highly recommend it to see <laughs> but like what was at the end um we just realized we didn't think about promotion we were like, okay, we have like something really nice, but like, what? Like, we're not a specialist. We just wrote it. We just like coded it. We just designed it, and now like, what to do with it? So, as a like failure lesson, <laughs> obviously, we tried to do it alone, and and we did it because we didn't have any support. But my question is like, where can we in the future look for support like this for like promotional support? Is it possible to get some kind of fund only for a promotion of the? Um, of the especially non-monetizing projects? I, I would say something very rude, but I think you have to build it yourself. Uh, and th this puts us as broadcasters in a r really weird position because our monopoly is slowly dying, basically, because uh, every content creator will become is becoming actually already its own distributor. So, uh, so, so I really don't think it should be like a, a budget uh, that it's you have like production budget and then the uh, the financing of distribution it should be integrated in the distribution budget. This is something we learned during many sleepless nights, also and many failures <laughs> uh, during the last uh, during the last ten years. Uh, is that uh, traditional TV funding? <coughs> Uh, TV and cinema funding actually would be like 10% uh, in uh, development, 10 to 20% in development, 80 to 90% into production. That's it. Uh, the huge problem uh, with interactive projects and with web-based projects in general is that, in general, the development takes a lot more time because you're prototyping all the time. You are not making the same format as always, so you put you should put 30% there. Production is pretty 
quick because normally if you wait two or three years, so what you are producing is not up to date anymore. By the way, uh, the, the, the newspaper thing with Fort McMoney worked pretty well. We, what didn't work well is that we made it in Flash in 2013. <laughs> 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 this was the biggest failure of the project. Uh, so because it just took three years in production. So, so obviously 2010, it was brilliant to do something in Flash with animations and so on. 2013, Apple killed it in between, so it was, uh, it was worthless. Uh, and then you have to uh, put, uh, I think, at least 10 uh, percent in uh, what we call beta testing, especially if it's interactive, because sometimes you, uh, you, are, you, you are not aware of it, but uh, you didn't think about promotion, but you didn't even think about will people be able to understand how to use this stuff. Uh, and then you have to put at least 20% uh, of the production costs into the marketing, which is, by the way, if you compare it to industrial standards, ridiculously low. There again, we can we can learn from the uh, video game industry. I was in Cologne like three weeks ago for the for the Gamescom, which is like the biggest gaming event in Europe. Uh, and uh, I was there speaking with guys from 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 Ubisoft, uh, just behind a, some kind of cosplay with like 10 two-meter high Germans dressed as trolls. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I just, uh, they, they just were talking with me about the budget. So uh, they were presenting the new Assassin's Creed, Assassin's Creed Origins about ancient Egypt. And uh, it's $80 million, the budget, uh, from which 40 million for the production and 40 million for the distribution and the marketing. So this is the real industrial standard. This is why I don't think we should create uh, like parallel subsidies for that. We, we should just integrate it into those uh, into those budgets. Yeah, I, I think I will try to be more optimistic than <laughs> <laughs> Alexander. Um, you've got a lot of. Uh, I think you've got a lot of um, European found like media uh, media culture for. Uh, Culture media, media culture. How do you say it in in, in English? It's, it's, it's creative Europe. Creative Europe. Yeah. Sorry. And um, so with Creative Europe, they're asking a lot uh, about. They're asking for digital projects that can build a kind of European culture and, and for digital. Uh, if you are if you're going on the website, that they ask. Uh, each year, maybe twice, you can apply for different kind of projects. And what's good, uh, as you said yesterday, William, yeah, with when you don't have money, sometimes you can have creative, <laughs> a way of thinking to and and what's interesting with uh, interactive projects, this uh, numeric like revolution, as we call it, it's that everything is uh, has to to still need to be built and uh, we need to build we really need to build something new uh, between countries and for instance when you're watching theaters for independent theaters when they want to be uh, to show particular uh, movies uh, outside from the blo uh, blockbusters they they collaborating together to show and to be uh, prescribers, we need, of course, we need market. Of course, we need people to promote projects, but we also need prescribers because we there is a lot of projects they already uh, exist, but nobody can uh, reach them because they don't know that they exist. But actually, they still uh, relevant. They still great even if they were released like uh, five years ago or, or, or two years ago or even th seven years ago but they need to go back to another device like mobile phone and not to stay on this stock but they can be rebuilt for that sometimes and uh, there is a lot of different projects from different countries I, I'm sure I, I don't know the the, the policy here and, uh, and what kind of project exists, uh, unfortunately, but I'm sure you can find a lot of uh, creators and we you just need to collaborate together and maybe it's also another way to think about uh, something to do, not by yourself, but uh, with all the people that they want to and like having, I, I don't know, like having 
each year one big uh, event uh, between all European countries. I, I don't know, like trying to find something. So this doesn't answer your question, but it does pull two things together that were said here, um, which is, so the budget categories are, it's a tight, it's a tight budget. But there's nothing in the budget for preservation and upgrading. And it's a little bit the, still the old broadcast idea or film idea. You make it, it's, it's stable, it's on a piece of video or it's on a piece of celluloid, no problem. It'll still be there in 20 years. These projects flash breaks and it's gone. The API changes and it doesn't work. Uh, Google Maps changes its something about its interface, broken project. It seems to me, I mean, I'm a historian and I, 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 I think we can learn a lot from looking at the beginnings of cinema, the beginnings of television, the beginnings of now. And I, and I always look back with a kind of resentment at the people who were there for the first years of film and never saved it. They were looking at the next thing. They didn't care about yesterday. It was about next week. And we're kind of in that same position. And the only way we're going to save these projects or stabilize them or keep them around for a few years, because they are really interesting, these are the first, our first baby steps in this direction. We need to have 5% of your budget <laughs> for preservation and upgrading. We just had a big conference in Montreal in May. I'm just finishing now the white paper. But this, too, is part of financing, because it's not going to come from the sky. And it's, it's a different problem uh, than we have in film. And, and uh, there's, a, there's preservation problems, but the state, usually the, the, the copyright process, takes care of that. In this case, these interactives are not yet part of that system, and they're not yet being funded for their, their futures are not funded. And they're very precarious. So just to say a, some, another log for the fire. <laughs> Uh, thank, so thank you for giving us this perspective, the French perspective. Also, we talked about the Can Canadian market, about the American one. Um, so my personal opinion is that here in Poland, we're somewhere at the beginning of the road, and there's no real um, schemes right now for funding interact interactive projects. So I actually have two questions. My first is about maybe thinking, taking a few steps back and I was wondering whether there were any conditions that had to be met at a certain point for this industry to be in the place where they are at right now. I mean, we were talking about Canada doing really well, about France. I mean, I know it's always very culturally specific and time specific, but maybe there is like, you know, the magic ingredient that you know about, that you can tell us about. So this is the first question, and when I, I will be giving away the mic, so I'm just gonna jump in with the second question, which is about, um, it's related to the distribution issues, and also about what you said, that people uh, on TV, they, they don't expect surprises. But I think uh, when I think of formats that work on the web, it also has to do with distribution. Uh, the formats that actually work are not uh, don't don't have to be only very beautiful and very interesting, but also it's always most of the time the projects that work are, so, are projects that actually reinvent the medium, like uh, new ways of using the medium, and they are still um, you know still you have to be that test them for the sake of being sure that somebody will understand them, but still it's like. Um, I have this feeling that this is, uh, there's still a re reinvention, reinvention of the medium, looking for new ways to use the, the technology that we have. And maybe that's, um, but maybe you could also show us some projects. Uh, I will go back to the first question and to say, like, maybe uh, to direct, but too directly, but. The magical uh, way will be to have a, a state policy <laughs> for that, and it's really uh, important for project if you want to be into the. Uh, I think it's if you want to to go to the cultural value, but if you don't have if you don't have it, uh, you can also build a kind of community and try to reach out with a co-production, uh, and and for instance, uh, Canada, there are really involved into also small uh, development, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, um, 
core development programs. They are developing that a lot with a lot of different countries. They don't have supports for creative, like South Africa, or, and specific for for digital ports. So it's also a way to go out and to talk with the countries that they are building it and they are trying to 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 make a more a larger uh, digital community. Yeah, for the first question. I, I, I would say uh, nearly the same. Th there was not like one miracle ingredient, it was just a good recipe of things. Or, uh, it actually wasn't really, um, at least how I, I lived through it, so it wasn't really aware, it was more like a big borscht where you put a lot of, lot of, things, uh, of, of things inside. But uh, it's, um, uh, I think the, the, if there's really one thing you need, it's, it's proactivity and uh, like, like public proactivity. This is what lacks in Germany, this is what lacks in the US, and this is what you have in Canada, this is what you have in France, uh, and what you had even before digital. And it was transposed pretty successfully uh, on digital. It's, uh, it's also not like if France and Canada invented it all through the, through the internet, it already, I, I mean, NFB has been around since 1939. So, uh, so, so it's really just, it was a successful transposition. And the second thing is also, and I'm speaking for uh, uh, the broadcasters, the ministries, uh, the funds, it's like allowing a big diversity of opinion, a big diversity of formats. Because otherwise, uh, the third condition will not come, which is uh, to, to learn to love failures uh, and to accept perfectly that uh, 70, 80 percent of the stuff you will be subsidizing will not work. Uh, this is why you are subsidizing it. If it's what it was already a, a, a model, you, you you shouldn't do it. So these are for me really the three uh, three big conditions that have to be there at the same time at the same place. And maybe I would just add that, um, and it's something you guys are this this event is part of. It's about it's about constructing an ecosystem of people with related skill sets and interests. So gamers are not going to be making that gamers want to make games, but the skill sets they have are for example, people that can work on that understand Unreal or Unity. Well, you need them if you're going to do VR and they might have started life as a gamer, but that's a skill set you can use. So Montreal I think has been very successful in sucking the game talent right out of Boston where I live. The the, the major game companies have just gone north to Montreal. They've, they've invested in their university programs that are kind of creating the people that will feed that industry. Okay, it's a 10-year vision, but it's paid off because the universities are, kids want to make games, but they understand now that they can also make interactive stories for newspapers. They could make it standalone interactives or, or VR projects. Um, what, what Montreal did was sort of bundle that together. They had uh, documentary makers, gamers, universities, even technology companies, and together you've got this kind of soup uh, that, 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 that comes to life. That's a bad analogy. Uh, you've got this mix, that this chemical mix that sort of starts to bubble and, and make things. So I think that's where the like finance ministry or the, or c c can be very helpful because they look at it as in economic development terms. They don't care what the content is. They care about the economic development. So they can be very helpful in building those conditions. Universities, I don't know the universities here, but I would assume Warsaw University of Technology is probably interested in sort of forward looking and the space where technology meets culture. So with some with a little bit of sharp elbows, they can maybe move into that space as well. But it's about building synergy and, and that if you're talking about a cultural change, that can be a very effective way. Actually, like the, the last uh, phrase you said was a little bit or covering the question I wanted to ask or like covering the answer I would love to hear. Uh, my question is about like uh, we are talking in here that we are at this really early stage of the development of interactive of like VR industry in Poland. And I think uh, like part of us is like working for public institutions. So we are trying as well to build this lobby to uh, 
to create the sustainable system of, uh, of uh, subsidies and help and support. So the synergy for me is like absolutely the key word, but I would love to ask like, how was it uh, when you were starting those, uh, uh, those subventions programs? Like how did you build the experts jury that they were respected from the, uh, from, you know, like let's say if here there are some gossips and the gossips are not our secret, like there is a lobbying of the, over the Polish Film Institute that they create the fund for VR. So how, uh, how to create the jury of experts that will be respected uh, by the, let's say, classical film industry, which always was great in Poland. So with the, with the huge respect over them, it's just about like the, the new way of thinking about the language we, we speak and we try to support. So in, in I, was, I wasn't there when the first uh, committee was uh, built up because uh, I arrived only two years ago. And I arrived at the beginning of VR project, uh, yeah. appears also. But, um, sorry, <laughs> my husband calling. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but what I can say from now how we built the committee uh, is what we are all talking about, about uh, cross-breeding in a way, like about uh, mixed culture. Uh, and we're trying, when we are doing the committee, we're trying to um, be a kind of a window of uh, what is uh, the project that we support. So we will, uh, as a president, for instance, uh, we choose all the time, from two, uh, four years now, we choose a filmmaker, uh, cinematographer, uh, a writer. So we had before Céline Siama, who's a, a, a filmmaker who did uh, Tomboy. Um, I don't know if you heard about uh, uh, Bon de Fille. C'était le même le titre en Pologne. Ah, thank you. Uh, and now we've got another filmmaker, like well known in France. But so do you have there, for example, the developers as well, or like somebody yes, who's we've like got experienced? 14, we've got 14 people. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, writers, there is developers, there is uh, distributors, uh, producers from cinema, from audiovisual, and from uh, also uh, now we are uh, we've got someone from a video game like uh, coming coming up like and a, tech a tech. Sorry? Tech tech, like technology, like because like games yeah. is already this kind of narration thinking. Like yeah, what's about the synergy of the competences on the level of like the development? We have a, a video game producer, mm -hmm. a, a woman who's there. So sometimes it's difficult because she has uh, her own point of view on interactive projects. But that's what we are looking for. We are looking for talkings uh, during the committee. So we're trying to uh, put a lot of different persons coming from uh, different uh, fields. They don't know each other and they will try to give us a uh, clue on the project with their own eyes and their own perspective. And because those kind of projects, they are just uh, a mixture of all those skills, so we're trying to be uh, as close as that. And from now, we also uh, want to uh, have a more um, highlight on uh, theaters distributions on theaters. So we are trying also to uh, have somebody who's, who's coming from theater, like very traditional one, to give his point of view on distribution for VR project because a lot of VR projects are going into uh, physical theaters and this is something that I, I, I'm, I think it could be the best way to have social um, social way. We, we are talking a lot about social VR, uh, how to, to, to share these experiments, these experiences because you are experiences something. And so it's a balance that you have to find and I'm sure that you will find all the skills you need here. It's just to speak with people and to try to create this same synergy in a small, um, how do you say, in a, yeah, in a small scale that you will try to have in a larger one. 
And I think you, 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 you should not be very afraid of, uh, again, failing and of not putting all the competences at the same time. I remember when, uh, when we started, uh, when artists started, uh, like in 2008, 2009, there were not all the right competences. Yeah. When I arrived in 2011, there still were no real competences because uh, we totally underestimated how complex the web had become and how many different types of work uh, you had to put in the same room. And I, um, I, I think it, it got even worse. There was this brilliant article on, uh, on, on Medium some, some months ago about uh, whoever tells you he's a digital expert is a charlatan. <laughs> Uh, because it's like an expert for geopolitics who specialized in the world since the beginning of history. It's, uh, it's just, just impossible. Totally agree. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember super well at, at the beginning, like we had small teams, like uh, there were, those were one men and woman teams. And I remember uh, when for my first project, uh, there was just a developer calling me directly, <clears throat> telling me I have a huge problem with the JSON because the JavaScript doesn't communicate with the MySQL. I felt so lonely. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and uh, and we had really to build it up. Now we have like like, like project managers, we have developers, uh, we even have uh, uh, people who are working on game design in house. So 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 this is uh, that become possible. But over time, I, I mean, you, there is no institution, public or private, when you can say, okay, let's just hire 15 people tomorrow, and try to figure it out. This is a luxury in general. Nobody from us uh, of us has. Sure. But you have to be trusting on the on the group synergy like like that's basic for me it's just, it's not about how to create the synergy into the group it's much more about how to create this like loving over this respect uh and this estimation of the jury that will be about to choose like because here if we are meeting in a in a forum uh let's say like about vr we are talking about this artistic art house small projects we are talking about the distribution and like multikino has started like mkadu uh this uh, the, the the cinema distribution which is nice but then you know that you go into the commercial and into the dinosaurs that are walking around so you speak mostly about how it's made on the technical level and how the stereotype st uh, uh, animation is made there and how it's lovely but you don't speak about the values then and then you have this uh, technical point of view which should be as well so for me like it's absolutely a key information that i'm aware of that the synergy is the key to the success most uh, important question for me is like how to create the trustful not from the expert point of view but like public point of view forum that decides about the distribution that it's uh, like one uh, uh, one direction we want to go. Like here it was a success at our meeting. But I think we're like running out of time so I will stay with this question for like a cigarette talks. But I, I think the point is that you are the expert, you are the person who will choose and you are the person to uh, this is the same for us when we are choosing the committee we need to say to the uh, hierarchy this is the best for that point and that point. So we are and even for, for me, when I arrived two years ago, I didn't know anything about uh, a digital uh, project. I was coming from documentaries uh, and experimental movies, like from the early age. So nothing to do with that, and specifically on Chinese projects. <laughs> so I was totally <laughs> outside of that. But uh, it's always, I think, even it, it could be like very naive to say that, but it's when a project is uh, uh, bringing you to, when you're reading some project and uh, there is something like really uh, strong into the story, everybody can see it, even if they are not specifically, technically. It's, it's not what we're asking uh, to the committee. We're asking them to feel something about a project, to believe into a project, and to give some clue sometimes, but we only here as a counselor, as a service, uh, service or something, we are not uh, working for the production. We need to trust also the producers and, and all the people that are, uh, th th they are involved with them. Like, I think it's really important to uh, know what you are doing and what for. Okay, sure, thank you. We, we didn't actually answer a, a 
question or a demand of, of Anna, who, uh, who just uh, asked us maybe to show two or three of those projects uh, we, we did, like just the trailers, you know, in order to, to, have, to be a little less abstract on the results of the financing we do, basically. There, uh, there's like one, one VR piece, one uh, interactive comic and one video game. Just also in order to show you uh, that it's it's very eclectic. I remember super well when we commissioned our first video game. It was like four years ago. There's a super brilliant guy coming into into our office, and he says, "Yeah, hello. I actually wanted to become a typographer, uh, uh, li li like working with, uh, with 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 mobile print letters." And then I just got aware it was the 21st century, and I basically wouldn't have a job. So I uh, I just study game design, and now I want to do both things together. And we eventually called it Typewriter, and it was a very very successful video game. Uh, the the idea is you play basically a, a column, like like you, the, you 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 are two dots in a sentence who are searching for the third dot of a sentence. Uh, 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 exactly like speakers, and you have those two 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 little columns. Uh, and each level uh, is another famous font. So the first level is Gothic, the second one is Garamond, like, like this Renaissance font, very, very parallel. Then you have Clarendon, like the Wild West font. You obviously have Futura, Times New Roman, Helvetica, which is like the most boring post-war type. Uh, we, we just don't want to, to have an opinion about funds. And then uh, eventually when you finish the game, you, uh, you just have a bonus level, C Comic Sans. Obviously the ugliest font in the history of mankind. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so uh, and, and he just pitched us that and we said, yeah, great, but we don't do video games, but great. And so he left the office and after two days we just said, yeah, but actually why don't we do video games? I mean, it's, it isn't written anywhere. We shouldn't do them, so we uh, we we also started this uh, this kind of of project. Maybe we could start with with songs in yeah. this case. So uh, uh, this is uh, one of the last games we did, uh, like some months ago. It is called songs like sense. Uh, it has, uh, uh, like in uh, uh, like in English, uh, in French, you have this this double meaning, like uh, this, uh, like um, uh, the sense of life, and then you you have like the direction in which you are moving, and it's based on a comic book uh, by Marc Antoine Mathieu, uh, and uh, the the pitch of the comic book it's basically you are wandering around uh, vacuous spaces. Searching for nothing more than the meaning of life. But it's a VR. You said it. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's a game, but uh, also in VR. So it's uh, it's not only a game you could play on your mobile phone, but you uh, you can actually uh, you have to play it for the best experience uh, on your VR goggles. Do you have sound? No, no sound. show you another one because uh, Thalena so it's uh, uh, an interactive storytelling it's also from uh, it's not from a comic book but she's uh, the writer she's a uh, uh, illustrator uh, she's doing comics so she created this uh, piece specially for mobile phone so I will just show you the trailer 
and to jump into another uh, into another way of exploring this device that is a mobile phone or tablet. I do like to show this uh, trailer because, as you can see, it's also uh, shown to. They, they they do a trailer not only for the content but also uh, to show you how to use it, and that's important for for interactive storytelling because you can have so many different ways to use it and to know if it's only 360, if it's interactive VR, it's if it's. Uh, uh, a game or not, so I think it's important when do you are doing a, a trailer to think about, to show what kind of interactivity do you have. So we're going to show another, a uh, uh, last one. Uh, an another project we did together, maybe this one, uh, you already have seen some of you as it was uh, showed in, 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 in Poland some, some months ago, it is called Notes on Blindness, did somebody see it? So, 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 so not so much people here, which, which is great. So basically, this is a, a pure VR piece. was launched last October, uh, and it got very strong support from uh, VR producers like Oculus. Uh, it really helped us when just the director of video of Oculus just uh, tweeted, uh, check out the first VR masterpiece. Uh, uh, honor to the to the authors who did uh, an absolutely great job. Um, it was meant as a feature documentary and a VR piece. Actually, uh, in 1983, there is this. Uh, there was this uh, Australian pastor John Hull, who uh, was slowly becoming blind. He was losing sight, and for him, it was like a metaphysical experience because, like, he was a pastor, so he didn't understand why God was doing this to him. Uh, he didn't understand uh, why he wouldn't see his uh, uh, his wife uh, aging with him. He uh, wouldn't see his children growing up. And so uh, he just tried to figure out what to do with his life. Uh, and he started a diary, an audio diary, just uh, speaking on cassettes. Uh, and he did it for 20 years, every day. So it's an archive of hundreds and hundreds of hours of audio reflections on blindness. Uh, and we thought it would be uh, very interesting to make people feel just what it may be to be blind. Just before uh, you start, what important to say also about the project that at first it was uh, thought for and created for device uh, for mobile phone, but VR appear. So the project changed uh, to fit the technology that that appear at this time. So I think it's really interesting to have this kind of organic way to think about the project. For 
Genesis cassette one, track one, Notes on Blindness. Sitting in the park with the children, I hear the footsteps of people walking past me, rustling of the newspaper, murmur of conversation. The myriad voices and sounds create a panorama of music and information. Where there is no activity, there's no sound, and then that part of the world dies. The earliest experience of panic took place in the middle of December. I left the house, but had only gone about a hundred yards when I was aware of a growing feeling of doubt and uncertainty. As if I was banging my head, my whole body against the wall of blindness. As one goes deeper into blindness, the things which once one took for granted then tried desperately to compensate for, in the end, cease to matter. to understand what it's like to be blind. Yeah, so just basically to give you uh, a little more concrete examples of, of what, what we are doing basically with this money we try to invest the best way we, we think we can. Other questions, maybe? Uh, well, actually, we are out of time. And since time is money, uh, I think uh, we'll need to vacate the room. But uh, thank you for the very stimulating uh, discussion. I think we learned a lot. Me personally, I learned that I should immediately stop using Helvetica because it's outdated. And uh, there's coffee. And there's uh, obviously room for more questions. Just. On a smaller, in a smaller group. So thank you very much, Anasha, yeah, Alexander Keating, and William Urikia. Thank you. <laughs>